Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. Hello, this is Ian McIntosh at Geeks for Comics at Circuit42.com. I am here with special guest Gary Reed, the founder and publisher of Caliber Comics. Gary, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we are doing well here. Uh, we just got back from Capital City Comic Con and got got to meet a lot of cool people like Kevin Eastman and a bunch of other people. Oh, Kevin. I know Kevin uh, pretty well. He's, he's a super nice guy. That's the guy in the industry. He, re he really is. Um, it's so funny. Like, the guys who work for Heavy Metal, like him and Bisley, like, you think these are going to be the people who, like, tear your head off. And they are always the most, like, gentle people that you meet at these conventions. Yeah, Kevin. I know uh, James O'Barr, who we'll be mentioning, of course, later. He is a he is is he still a regular at that com? Is he still what? Is he still a regular there? Uh, no, he's. Um, I don't know where he lives, but he doesn't live in the Detroit area anymore. Um, I think he lives in. Uh, I don't even know where he lives. <laughs> I, I, maybe Texas. I think it might be Texas. Yeah, I actually got to meet him, and he did a he did a great he did a great treat for a friend of mine because. She grew up, you know, she grew up with the first printing that you guys did to the crow. And right. she's been, she's been a huge fanatic long before the movie came out. And she was at work. So what I did, I was talking to James at the con and I said, Hey, could you do me a favor? I've got a, I've got a friend of mine who's at work. I didn't mention she was in Arizona and we're here in Texas. So, um, I'd said, Oh, could you say hi to him on the, hi, hi to her on the phone? And so he's talking to her. And I hear him say, oh, honey, why, uh, why aren't you here with us over at the convention? And I just hear over the phone, oh, I'm in Arizona. Oh, oh, you're in Arizona. I had no idea. I'm sorry. But he got to meet her earlier this year. They apparently talked for almost two hours. Well, that was good for her. Yep. So um, for, those, you know, for those who don't know, I mean, Caliber, you know, your company start, started, really did start the careers of a lot of huge people in the comic industry, like Tim Vigil, James O'Barr, and uh, Guy Davis. And yeah, I mean, you know, um, a lot of people started at Caliber. Uh, some people came in. I mean, Tim Vigil uh, is pretty well already established. Uh, you know, and, and I always, uh, I'm indebted to Tim. Because, you know, he came in uh, to Caliber, which is a new company, and he was sort of our big gun before he first started off. You know, Guy Davis, uh, you know, he had been doing a series uh, called The Realm. The funny thing is, I think like was that I was going to mention Ed Brubaker, you know, with his work on low, on his low life, on his work on low life, and a bunch of the other and a couple of the other books that he did for you. I think a lot of people don't realize that someone like Brubaker, how long he's actually been around in the comic industry. Yeah, because yeah, he wasn't he wasn't in the original uh, launch of Caliber. He, uh, he came in a couple of years later, you know, along with Mike Allred, um, and both of them had done work with Slave Labor. I think Ed's book was with Great Labor, I'm pretty sure it was. And then so we, we sort of published him and uh, Ed um, got involved into it, some anthologies, um, a book called Monkey Ranch. And uh, Mike all read, uh, of course, his graphic music, which introduced uh, the character Madman, uh, which of course became his uh, sort of a uh, column card after that. And we had uh, quite a few uh, new people start, you know, Paul Tobin and uh, so I had already got a couple of things. Paul told us to go after the French. That was pretty early on. Uh, Mike Perkins, um, Mike Carey, they got their start at Caliber. There's quite a few people that got their start. Yeah. Some people just you know, came in a little bit later and then, um, you know, so they were already, they were already published, you know, a couple. 
multiple places, maybe. Uh, but they, they sort of made their mark in caliber. It's it's crazy. You know, you look at all these other people, and then you have, in addition, you got people like Jim Califor, Kevin Van Hook, and uh, Sir Ramon, and you know, all these people just blowing up in the industry. And you know, as yeah. a publisher, you know, you have to look at these people, you have to look at their work, and um, you seem to have a really good, you seem to have a really good eye for finding a lot of kind of fresh talent as they're coming into the industry. What was it, you know, what was it, and what is it now with what you're doing? That you that you particularly looked for, like what was the was there ever a particular style, or just um, a particular element of their work? Well, you know, I have to look at what the company was. You know, it's creator owned, so so you know, it had to have a strong sort of a vision. And you know, I, I think back then, you know, in the um, in, um, late nineteen eighties, mostly in the early nineties, uh, that's when the Albert uh, was mostly around the nineties. You know, they, they sort of had to say something. Um, you know, it just wasn't doing tennis. Um, you know, and it wasn't uh, the superhero type art. You know, so it sort of had to be a combination of having the right story and the right way of telling it. It had to be interesting. And, and that's what I look at. You know, I mean, some of the artists you look at, I mean, the art may have seemed a little bit crude. Um, but, that, you know, that you have to tell a story. And so, and that was it. You know, we didn't do superheroes for the most part. You know, we did do quite a few of those, but those were sort of a side branch. And so it just sort of, you know, you just get a feel for it. You look at it. Now, of course, we, I can look back and look at all the success stories, but there was a lot of people that didn't make it. You know, there's a lot of books that just didn't work out. But we, we sort of forget about those. You know, they get washed away. But, um, you know, it's easy to remember the ones that worked and the creators that worked. I mean, there's a lot of creators that came in and they did something. And, you know, maybe they were a one-trick pony, and that's all they had, you know. And some of them felt like, okay, this is not worth the work. Uh, you know, the, the financial remuneration is not worth all this work. Um, so there's a lot of people that dropped out. But, of course, you know, it's easy to remember the ones that started off and kept going and are still around. It, it does seem, though, that, you know, you've got more, I mean... You know, looking even further at some of the people who are involved, like Brian Michael Bendis, David Mack, Mike Diodato, Mike Grell, it does seem like, well, obviously, like Mike Grell was someone who's definitely pre established coming in, but it does seem like there were just a lot of, you know, there were more, definitely more successes than more successful workers coming out of the company than otherwise. But what do you, you know, what, what is it about the successful mentality of the comic book creator and perhaps someone like you said, someone who kind of fizzles out? Um, in the why? industry, what's the I difference? Think why, why caliber worked in the beginning is you know we had um, you had the Mitch Lack and Guy Davis and you had Mark Wintry and Mark Bloodworth and Jim O'Barr and um, you know and some other people and when we first started caliber, you know you know they come to the office which is the back of one of my stores. I had four stores at the time. And, um, the caliber office was in the back of my large store. You know they come you know. I don't know if it was every week. It seemed like it was every week. I think it probably came in to get the new comic. And, you know, we'd stay late and they would draw each other's sketchbooks. And then, you know, they sort of um, bonded together. We would travel to cons together. Um, and so, so you sort of had a unity and, you know, and, and you could, uh, they could work with each other and say, you know, somebody said, I can't draw this character. And so somebody else would draw it and show how they do it. Um, so it's almost like a studio, um, an official studio. And then even later, when we had people like Mark Rickett and David Mack and um, uh, Bendis, you know, they also did the same thing. They hung around together, you know, and a lot of them are still really close friends. You know, they met via Caliber. And then, um, you know, we had, uh, later on, we had with the, the Pro Boys, Jim and Joe, um, you know, and all their friends they brought in, you know. And so, you know, there's always this collection of um, creators together. And I think that really helped, um, you know, a lot of people get over their uh, deficiencies, uh, being able to talk to another artist or a creator about certain things. So I think there was a lot of uh, sort of like that studio atmosphere, even though it was unofficial and pretty short lived. I think it was uh, they weren't working in isolation. You know, I got I got to touch on something. Like one of the things that most people, you know, they strictly know you for for caliber for caliber, but a lot of times they don't know. A lot of people don't know about the saber merger. And the, is it saber or stabber? The, sorry, the uh, Stephen merger and um, your work with uh, Tom McFarlane. 
where you were actually named the um uh you were actually named the vice president of McFarland Toys. Um how did how did that come how did that come about and how how different do you think you know your work in the industry was with McFarland than it was working with Caliber? Oh, well, it's completely different. Um, what happened with Faber is um, at about uh, four years of Caliber, uh, Paul Burke ran Staber. Um, and so we, we were working together on different projects. And so we were close friends, so we said, why don't we just merge the company? And we're repeating a lot of different things. And so we moved into one general office. We merged together. And then uh, we had all these uh, different plans going on. Uh, we were going to do some books with Disney. Uh, we were going to do uh, the Penthouse 25th anniversary book. So part of our job was going to the Penthouse archives and going through all the models uh, to pick out which one to use. So that was a tough job. Um, and we were working with, um, you know, a lot of large companies. And then um, Paul was talking to Todd McFarland about um, Todd got an offer to get some toys made from um, a large company on the tower or Hasbro. I don't remember which one. And he was worried about the quality. He wanted high quality. And so, uh, you know, he, he talked to Paul. Um, Paul did uh, the comic book great videos with Stan Lee. And Todd was interviewed on one of those by Stan. And so that's how Paul and Todd met each other. And Paul said, well, you know, the only way you can make sure you get it done right is do it yourself. And that got Todd and Paul talking. And then they formed McFarland Toys. So basically, McFarland Toys was Todd was in the Arizona. It was me and Paul and uh, um, Adel Martin. And then some two designers in New Jersey. Um, and that was the beginning of McFarland Toys, and you know, we didn't know what we were doing. And I think that helped because we approached it from a whole different way. And so we started the toy company, and then um, you know started hiring people. So we went from four people to I don't know forty within the first year. But yeah, it was a whole different world uh, dealing with the toy company than uh, the Caliber Publishing. I was still doing Caliber, and I was still running my four store. And I was the executive uh, vice president of McFarland Toys. I think, you know, in many ways, um, it, it's kind of like when you have a, a director, you know, like a first time director who's done, you know, short films, special effects, um, commercial work coming into film. And they always kind of say the thing that makes a director like that so interesting or a creator like that so interesting is that they don't know the rules, you know, what you're supposed to be able, what you supposedly can and can't do. And you'll get some, you'll get that experimentation that you won't necessarily get from a company that's been doing this forever. And I, do you think in some in some ways it was kind of the same situation with McFarland, with you and McFarland? Yeah, I think that when we were um, you know developing the toy company, I mean, so it's easy enough to find out what the rules are, you know. And then we actually um, had brought in somebody, um, and so that was told the way things had to be done. And we said, well, why? Why does it have to be done that way? And, uh, you know, and, and Todd, Todd's goal was to make the coolest toys possible. And so he told the designers, um, and Frank and Tony Bellotto in New Jersey, he said, you guys make the best toys you can. Don't worry about budget. Don't worry about anything. Just make the coolest possible toys. And um, so they did, and it ended up going back and forth between them and Todd, you know, and then um, we had the great toys. And it changed the, the action figure industry completely. Um, and I think that we knew what the rules were, but we knew how to break them as well. You know, we really started pushing the whole collector aspect right from the beginning. Yeah, because and we came from sorry. a comic background on collectors, so we said, why doesn't why can't this work with the toys? You know, let's short pack um, the Mel Bolger figure so there's only one per team instead of three. You know, and our guy told us, no, you have to have three. You have to have Twelve figures, three of each. So we said, "No, we'll have a bunch of spawn, one Melvulture, and that that became a chase figure." And everybody went to buy a whole case just to get that one Melvulture. I just remember a kind of an infamous letter in an issue of Spawn, one of the early issues of Spawn, where you had a dad actually sending an angry letter because he and his son had to go through all of these toy stores in their area, and then they went to a comic store. This was in the action figure boom. You know, when the companies were like, this action figure is worth $200. I 
How much did you buy it for? I bought a case for $200. Okay, then. And I just remember this letter from this dad who was almost, like, on the verge of just anger just over that Malbolgia figure because they couldn't find it anywhere. And in many ways, you gotta, you gotta ask how many, if, if this dad was buying a figure of Satan for his child or buying a figure of <laughs> Satan for himself. And, yeah, yeah, well, sorry. what happened with the Malbolgia figure is, uh, especially at the Christmas time, is a lot of people were hiring in to Toys R Us just for the specific purpose of going to a match with Malbolgia but all the toys. And there was this cherry pick all the toys, so, you know, most toys are up to Mount never, ever made the show. That's crazy. I remember, I don't know if you ever read any of the Clark's comic books by Kevin Smith, published by Oni, but oh, yeah. the, I, I, I still love that hol- that holiday special. I think, it, no, it wasn't a holiday special, it was the first comic book, and it was just designed to just tear into that collector's market, and it wasn't long after that that the collector's market actually started to um, really slow down. I mean, I'm not saying it's correlated with that comic book, but it did kind of happen right around the same time. Yeah, well, that was the 90s, you know. I had my stores in the 90s, and, uh, yeah, that was a crazy time. It was just unbelievably crazy, uh, and it made no sense. You know, it's sort of like the black and white boom that happened in the 80s. You know, you had to try to figure out, um, you know, when to get in and when to get out. You know, speaking of that, speaking of the black and white boom, you look at the... You look at the the comic book and indie market, the direct market now compared to how it was, and I mean this is my this is my personal opinion. I want to know what yours is as well. Um, it's so much easier to you know it's so much easier to have the variety of audiences now that weren't there maybe even ten years ago, and it's so much easier to get these independent comic books that that um. You know, comic store owners would order five of, and just, that's it. They wouldn't bother to order any more, or sometimes not even bother to order the follow-up issue. I mean, what's your opinion of the comic book market, and how it's, and how indie, and how indie publishers are treated now? I know where you're going with that. Sorry. And, uh, yeah, it's completely different. Um, you know, when Caliber was around, um, the first time, you know, I don't know, I think at one time there were like 14 different distributors. Um, you know, and so pretty much every distributor would carry every comic they would offer. You know, the stores still had to order. And back then, the stores, uh, you know, they had to take guests. So they would, um, you know, they had to order for the shelf. Now, in today's world, it's completely different. You have one distributor, and they don't carry everything. Uh, they go through um, the evaluation. You know, because, you know, they're dying for the business. So they look at you, okay, if we carry this, how many are we going to sell? How many make money? Is it going to cost us money to carry this? And so they reject a lot of titles. And, you know, they reject a lot of good titles. And, and they understand that, but they just feel, you know, we can't carry everything because there's not enough stores out there that will order this stuff. And most stores, not all of them, but most stores, you know, they rely on the diamond previews or advanced orders. So basically what stores are becoming is a... Uh, sort of an ordering house. The customers come in the store and say, this is what I want for the, uh, the month of April, and they give them a list. And so the store adds up all their guaranteed orders, and that's what they order. You know, of course, for Marvel and DC or other key titles, they may order a few extra for the shelf. But, you know, the margins are so tight with them that they have to minimize um, every boost that they can. So they basically say, okay, if I can order these 200 black and white titles or independent and I order to sell out, you know. I got to order for three of this, I'll order three, they sell out. If somebody wants it, I can reorder. In, back in the, the early days, you couldn't reorder and, and get a uh, pretty good guarantee that you were going to get it. Nowadays, you can. Mm-hmm. So there's no extra order there. There's really that much for the shelf. That's the thing, though, that we have to, you know, we have to be happy for stores like, you know, Austin Books, uh, Dragon's Lair, which is, uh, dragons are here in San Antonio where I am and places like Golden Apple who are really, you know, are willing to order everything, who are willing to give those books a shot. And, I mean, do you think it's just because of the uh, larger cities, larger variety of people who are going to come in that those few stores like that will be willing to basically pick up anything? Or 
do you, um, or what do you think is a reason for that? Well, I think that, um, you know, you have different types of clients, uh, you know, customers or clients. Uh, you have the ones that come in weekly to get the, the, the superhero. Uh, you know, I mean, you have to look at um, the comics as almost two completely different worlds. You have the superhero world, which includes a lot of licensed stuff. Um, you know, most of the people that come in every week. Um, you know, this is what we generally think of as the comics market. And then you have the peripheral people who, who may only follow one or two titles. Um, they come in maybe, you know, once a month, once every six weeks. And, you know, they pick up stuff they missed. You know, if they miss an issue, it's no big deal. Um, they pick up a lot of graphic novels. You know, they're, they're not coming in every week. Um, and that's who most of the independent titles appeal to. Um, you know, because people are into the, um, the superheroes more or a licensed title, you know, they're going to come in because they know it's going to be, you know, every week or, you know, a monthly title every month. So they're going to come in on a much more regular basis. You know, I mean, that's a lot of generalities, but uh, pretty much that's the way it is. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, around, it was around the late 2000, it was, well, it was either a couple of years prior to 2000 when the Spawn Power Cards games came out. And unfortunately, you know, for um, this situation for this situation for um, Cal, um, caliber left things really really hard for the company. Yeah, and I, I don't think people understand how hard it is because it's just devastating the company. And, and the issue was in sorry. the '97 or '98 somewhere around there. Do you mind if I ask you know for for you know for myself and for my listeners uh, what exactly happened with caliber at that point in time? And so, um, you know, when we were with Staber, and then of course Tyler with my own toys, um, you know, we, we, uh, we're looking to branch out in different ways, and collector cards like Magic were, were huge at the time. And we said, well, we should do something with some of our characters, like Death World and the Realm. And so we, um, were, uh, working with a couple guys that were working with, um, uh, Bob Hickey, um, and I forget the name, I think it was uh, Skystorm, I think that was the name. And we had uh, just finished doing a run of comics for Walmart. We produced comics for Walmart. Uh, the Big Bang comics that went to Image for a long time. Uh, they actually got their start at Caliber, and we sold them to Walmart. We sold a lot of the Tone Press stuff. Um, that's a line of historical and biographical comics. We sold a lot of those to uh, Walmart. We sold, sold uh, this series called Storm Press. And that's how we got hooked up with uh, uh, the Studio. And so we started, started discussing about doing a card game. And so we came out with uh, what's called Power Cards. And then a couple people that worked with um, uh, came to work for Caliber. And we sort of um, did the Power Cards and then ran that off to, uh, we got licensed with Todd, which was kind of easy. Um, but we got licensed with Todd uh, for Spawn. We were talking to Rob. Uh, like that, we're talking Jim Lee, and so it all it all was the first. So we spent an enormous amount of time and money, um, you know, generating new art, coloring, you know, designing the game, replaying it over and over and over, to make sure everything works. And then we, um, you know, searched around for a printer that could handle this. We found a printer in Kentucky. We, we had a personal eight, um sales rep that dealt with us. Um, I won't give his last name, but his first name was Mike. And so, you know, this is, you know, a year-long process, a year and a half. Um, Joe Martin and um, Tim Parsons, the two guys that most important in the game, I mean, they were working 16 hours a day. And so, we got the game all set to go, to get the printing done. And then what happened, and they didn't tell us, was they were running short on time. And so what they did is they sent the cards out, once they were cut, for correlation to another printer and another state. And they didn't tell them how important was the coalition. You know, because we had, I think, it was 200 different cards. You know, so if you buy a pack of 15, you should have 15 different cards. And if you buy a box of packs, you, know, you, should, you should be able to get all the different cards. In there. Yeah. Well, they were doing packs of 15 of the same card. Mm -hmm. So if you bought a, a booster pack, we call them. They'll be all 15 of the same. All the decks were the same cards, the same 50 cards in every deck. Um, so, you know, like the um, state of Michigan, we all have the same 50 card deck, same 15 card boosters. You know, Texas would have the same different set, but the same 50 cards of the deck, 15 cards in the booster. Everything was shipped out because it went straight from there, and uh, everything was shipped out now, so we started getting all the material back. 
most definitely. Um, now on the up the, on the upside, you were telling me that recently that you were actually working on trying to bring Calibre Comics back as a company. Uh, what's going on with that? Well, I, I brought back Caliber um, earlier this year, and what happened was I left comics in about 2000. I closed Caliber and I went back to um, teaching. I have a master's degree in biology, so I started teaching. And said, okay, well, you know, the Caliber had its run. It's over. And then um, I started getting contacts by people who wanted to, uh, you know, reprint, uh, Byron Priest wanted to reprint the Baker Street, and then Penguin Books wanted me to write the horror book. And then Joe Pruitt started up Death Model Studios, so I started bringing back uh, Dead World. And so I sort of got back into it. And then uh, cooking had all this old stuff that I had of my stuff, as well as other people who um, I published. And, you know, I said, well, you should republish it. And go, I don't know who to publish it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, me and Raphael Neander started up a new company called Transfusion, which is basically going to reprint all my stuff, all of his stuff, and some friends. And then Transfusion, after 50 graphic novels, we started getting uh, so many requests um, you know, to publish stuff. And, uh, and we really weren't going through Diamond or anything. You know, we were starting to hit the digital markets, but the digital markets all say, well, you know, nobody knows who Transfusion is, so, you know, why don't you call it Caliber? And I got the point. I go, I got Transfusion and Caliber Digital. Um, and we were dealing with the people in um, Hollywood and some licensing, and they were referring to Caliber. I said, I got to bring it all into under one name. And so I decided to go back to Caliber because that made the most sense. And at the same time, I was dealing with Derek Riker, um, who runs Eagle One Media. He, he does uh, independent film distribution. He, he's one of the first guys that was doing digital. And uh, and he wanted to do some stuff with Caliber. We're going back and forth, so we decided just to bring back Caliber together. So he's my partner in Caliber, and he still handles all the digital stuff, and I handle both the um, more of the publishing. And so we brought back Caliber, and you know, not, not to make a big fanfare of it, because you know, there's no. Uh, no, no big announcement, no big guest, uh, you know, big name artist that we're bringing in everything. It's just sort of consolidating everything, um, getting everything that Caliber represented um, or owns back into print, back into digital. Um, you know, we signed uh, with the management agency, you know, to try to get a pedal out to Hollywood. So I did that an option, you know, maybe up to 18 different properties. I just don't send out announcements on it because it doesn't mean anything. You know, not being made, it doesn't mean anything. So, so it's sort of just putting us in position. Um, you know, no, no grandiose plans or anything like that, or no major announcements. But uh, you know, we got some good books coming up. Um, you know, collecting all the older stuff, getting everything out digital. So um, you know, it's a small company, but uh, I like where it's going. In many ways, it really, especially if we look at the, <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned Hollywood, and just, uh, you mentioned Hollywood optioning. And in many ways, it's probably a better idea to do it what you're doing, because look what Hollywood and com the comic industry was doing right after X Men came out, where everything was being optioned. Um, Fathom was being optioned, and I don't even remember re anyone really even reading Fathom anymore in the in the early two thousands. And it was Nickelodeon of all studios. You had all these movies being announced, and maybe maybe a tenth or even less so of those movies. Ever came to fruition, and it seems yeah, like yeah, a lot that's of. That's why but... I don't announce anything. You know, so the, the one I did announce uh, was Dead World. You know, George Clooney signed it up. I mean, it was on the fast track. We had the script. Uh, one of us was excited about it. I was getting calls from special effects people. You know, um, so you know that seemed like it was almost a sure thing. Um, and, um, and but that one didn't happen. And then Dead World got signed again. We had the script from. Um, you know, the guy that wrote the X-Men movies, the guy that wrote the Watchmen movies, you know, he wrote the script of Denver, uh, the director was uh, unofficially attached, and so that seemed to be going as well. But, you know, it, it's a hard game in Hollywood, um, you know, because nowadays they're like independent comics, you know, they have to sort of get the financing first uh, before, you know, a lot of studios are going to look at them. It's not the whole day that the studios, you know, being low and everything that comes along. So you got to have all the pieces in place. And, you know, it just took too long to get all the pieces in the place. Once you get one piece, you go after the second piece, well, that first piece can't wait anymore, you know, so, you know, things just keep falling apart. That's why when you hear movies, you know, um, 
like my mom always talked about, she, you know, she always said, well, it's going to happen, you know, because look at Dirty Dancing, that took 17 years to get deep, you know. It's a different thing, Mom, but okay, maybe it's a point. So, as we, as we bring the, inter- as we bring the, um, as we bring the show to a close, um, where can people find where can people find you on this wonderful, wonderful world called the internet? No, oh, we're Caliper, calibercomics.com. dot com. I'm trying to keep it simple. So, uh, calibercomics.com, dot com. We're also Caliper Comics uh, Facebook, is, uh, and that's why we we go by the name Caliper Comics because that's a trademark. We already have that, um, and that has uh, all the information about the, all of our titles. Uh, something that's a digital, um, you know, the digital market is something that's just really growing right now. Um, it's hard to get a handle on how successful it's going to be, but it seems to be going pretty well. All right. Well, thank you for coming on this episode. Um, we are here at we are here at Geeks for Comics with our special guest Gary Reed, and that brings us to the close of our newest episode. Remember, keep reading comics, or Gary Reed will come break your knees. I mean, he won't. <laughs>